my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stand Welcome to The Well. My name is Aaron Stritzel. We're glad you're joining us here today. Uh, if you're new, you're our guest, please let us know you're here. You can text WELCOME to uh, the phone number 480-530-7234. Also, if you don't receive Pastor Ryan's weekly emails and updates and things that are going on at The Well, you can sign up for that. Just jump onto our website, wellchurch.org. Scroll down to the bottom and you can sign up for those weekly emails there. Well, today we continue on our sermon series on the Ten Commandments, talking about the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. As we've been discussing in this sermon series, our, our focus is really on two things. Number one is understanding that in context, even though they're thousands of years old, these commandments were a very uh, much a, a progressive step forward. And also, the second thing is, even though they're thousands of years old, that they can still be very relevant for us today, especially as we dive deeper into what these commands actually mean. So I know we've talked about context before, but I think it bears repeating that these commands were sort of given under this context where a group of people, the Israelites, were just set free from slavery, Egyptian slavery. This is the Moses story, right? We've all heard the Moses story. Moses, uh, through, through God's leading, sets the Israelites free and liberates them. This is the Red Sea, right? And now they're free and they're wondering questions like, how, how do we live? What does it look like when I actually can do whatever I want? What is good? What is healthy? How do we create and organize a just and fair society so we treat other people well and I get treated well so we're not taking advantage of each other and we're not finding ourselves back in slavery? <laughs> the first three commands have to do with God, especially honoring God, as if to say, first and foremost, if you put God number one, you learn to honor God, that the rest of these commands begin to fall more naturally into place. So the fourth command, now transitioning, talking about honoring the sacred rhythms of life. 
So let's read the text today. Exodus 28 through 11 says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. The Hebrew word here for remember is zeko, which just means to keep or to observe. There's an interesting and very clear correlation between the Sabbath day and honoring the rhythms that God, Creator, has set up during creation. Six days God created, on the seventh day God rested. Underneath all this, as I've just said a couple different times, is this idea that there are sacred rhythms to life. There's rhythms, ways of living, ways of being human, ways of setting up our life that lead to our greatest healing and wholeness and flourishing. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is I think it's easy for us to think, well, slavery was a thing way back then. But the reality is over 40 million people still live in some form of slavery where they don't have full free will. They're, they're in bondage. They're, they often can't choose how many hours they work, what they do, uh, what they can't do. Here's an interesting statistic. It's over 70% of these that still live in modern day slavery are women and, and girls. Clearly, we're not through this idea of slavery. We live in this. And I would argue that, that actually what's happening that's perpetuating some of this is that we live in a culture that values productivity more than it values honoring the sacred rhythms of life. I was recently listening to this podcast. The, the po podcast title is For the Wild. And they interviewed an artist, um, an activist theologian named um, Trisha, Trisha Hershey. And she talked about multiple things. Here's, here's a woman of color. I'm gonna drop the link in the comment section below so you can come back to it at a time and listen to the podcast. It's phenomenal. There's layers of things going on here. The title of the podcast was Rest as Resistance. And she talks about this idea as a person of color where she was working against sort of racism and anti-black systems of oppression and finding herself exhausted and finding herself needing to find a rest and saying, I can't keep fighting against this in healthy ways unless I learn to rest. And her herself finding rest. She started a ministry, I think it's called Nap Ministry. The importance of taking naps, the importance of finding rest, right? So as a black person herself, fighting against these systems of oppression, knowing and understanding I need to find rest in order to make this a sustainable, healthy thing. She talked about also how our education system awesome, uh, often um, promotes lack of sleep. Like it's a badge of honor if you stay up into the wee hours of the morning studying, right? She also talked about how it's a public health crisis. It's a public health issue, rest, finding ways where we can live more healthy lives. Uh, much of her uh, uh, theology is based off what is called liberation theology, which is stemmed off this idea that salvation is really about finding true liberation for all people, especially those who are most oppressed and marginalized. So liberation theologians look at this story of Exodus and say, this is what God's heart is for all people. That those 40 plus million that are still living in sort of modern day poverty find true liberation but also for those of us who may not be stuck in modern day slavery, but are often stuck in our own enslaved cycles of oppression to find true liberation. One of the things that she talked about that I thought was most fascinating was she named something she called grind culture, G-R-I-N-D, grind culture culture, which is this idea really that the more you grind, the more you hurry, the more you produce, the more you are worth. And we're stuck in this sort of enslaved culture, grind culture, where we find our worth, our value on what we do. There are several problems with, with this, which is what the Sabbath day, this idea of keeping the Sabbath kind of confronts. Uh, rest as resistance, Sabbath as resistance. To remember the Sabbath is to carve out a day of true restfulness is an act of resistance against a culture that tries to convince us 
that we're only valuable when we're producing. But carving out a day of the week, we remind ourselves that our value, our worthiness, isn't just on what we do, but who we are. It's inherent within us based upon a God who created us that says, I love you as you are. Finding rest means we resist both the inner and the outer pressures. Let's be honest, like we all find value sometimes when we get things done, when we can go through that checklist, when we get things done, right? It's not just external, it's within us too. This pressure that we put on ourselves because, man, I feel good when I can get a lot done, right? And sometimes we just put more and more and more on that. Some of us more than others based on our personality, but we all, I think, are tempted to do that. Finding rest means that we don't wake up day after day as the Israelites found themselves in slavery, woke up, made bricks, made more bricks, went to bed, woke up the next day, made more bricks, more bricks. Finding rest says, no, this isn't a healthy cycle. I'm going to detach, disconnect, and breathe. Talking about busyness, Dallas Willard once uh, said, this quote stands out to me. He says, the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day is hurry. Simple, straightforward, but profound. As somebody who I really value this idea and wrestle with this idea, I'm always interested in spiritual formation. How are we being formed? Because I think we're all spiritual beings. doesn't matter what tribe, what label we use. We're spiritual beings, and we're all being formed. The question isn't, am I being formed? But how am I being formed? Remember the Sabbath means we slow down, we disconnect We remind ourselves what really matters, what's really important. We find rest. We find a sort of sense of quiet. We disconnect from the matrix. We disconnect from the water that was surrounding all of our culture that says more and more and more busy. I can't tell you the number of times I work at a a chocolate cafe where somebody comes in and is like, how's it going? They're like, man, I'm just so busy. And it hits me that we say that now in America as it's like expected. And if you're not busy, something's wrong. You're wasting your life or you must be lazy, right? I mean, that's an issue. It's an issue, by the way, too, and something I've wrestled with as a pastor, right? Where I feel like, man, if I'm not busy, then I'm not keep keeping up. I'm not worth my value. What are they paying me for, right? It's something I've been thinking about quite a bit, um, and I, I think this will cross over to all spheres of life, but I've looked at the, the lack of health in pastors, Pastors are often some of the least healthiest people. Uh, They often die early. They're often struggling with all kinds of health conditions. They're very stressed. But this wasn't always the case. It's actually recent. Something shifted in the 20th century where pastors used to be some of the healthiest people. They used to live longest. Now it's the opposite. It's something shifted. And I I can't say for certain based on facts, but this is my suspicion. That once upon a time, pastors were parish shepherds. You, you had a neighborhood, basically, of people you interacted with. And you were a shepherd. You were guiding people in that. And, and you were connected, deeply rooted to their stories and your story. And it was being with people. And then something began to shift where now all of a sudden churches become a business. And you need to grow your business. And how do you become the next mega church? And this pastor has so many people, and this church has so many people, and they produce this book, and uh, you know, and they're talking about this. And then there's this inner compelling drive to be more successful. And I suspect that is a big part, if not the biggest part, that led to pastors being some of the most unhealthy people. You can cross that over into all kinds of things and look at even our education system, right? All things, all kinds of our institutions are fragmenting and becoming broken, partly because we're all about how can we produce the most with the least amount of money instead of how do we honor the sacred rhythms of life? (laughs) Um, When we get to the end of our lives, we're not going to care how much money we made, how big our salary was, how big our house was. We're not going to care about those things. What matters most is really, how did I spend my life and did I hang out with the people that meant the most to us? See, I've wrestled with this idea too that my kids, as they get older, they're not going to care if my dad was a successful pastor or how big his church or how much money he made or did we own a house or how many times were we able to go on an exotic beach vacation. They're going to care more about if they felt love and I suspect they're going to spell love T-I-M-E. Did my parents give me time 
or were they distracted with everything else? Were they preoccupied, caught up into this vicious cycle of hurry, busyness, and producing? Um, one of the modern day books that really addresses this idea uh, of busyness and hurry is um, written by a megachurch pastor, former megachurch pastor, John Mark Comer, who wrote a book. The title itself is profound, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. In it, he basically says, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life if you want to live any sort of spiritually mature life. Just get rid of it. Make it a big aim and focus of your life because hurry is robbing you of a spiritual, soulful life where you are being formed. And he said a ton of fantastic stuff. I'll try to drop the link in the, the comment section below as well. Um, but the, the crux of it was how do we honor those rhythms? How, how do we honor daily? weekly, which is really the Sabbath, is, is how do we honor that, but monthly or quarterly or even yearly? How do we take time, larger vacations, time away? How many times I've been on a retreat or on a vacation, day two or three comes and I'm like, holy cow, I didn't realize how tired I was. I didn't realize how exhausted, how much of a hurry I was in. See, what happens, I think, is as we disconnect and find rest, we realize the insanity that has become sort of norm, right? On a scale of one to 10, I think what happens is we live our lives, we kind of turn up the dial little bit by little bit. It's like heating up the water in a, a pot with a frog, right? You don't notice it when you do it little bit by little bit, but pretty soon, all of a sudden, you're running so much that it just becomes the new norm. So when you stop, you're like, whoa. What was I doing? I can't, almost every single time I take a, 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 va a vacation or a break or a retreat, that feeling comes, which should tell us something. Like our society, our culture, our own doing for ourselves is not healthy. It's not living a soulful life. And one of the quotes that he mentions here that I think is worth talking about has to do with where we put our attention. He writes this, what you give your attention to is the person you become. Put another way, the mind is the portal to the soul. What you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you give your attention to. Your mind is the portal to your soul. What you give your attention to shapes the trajectory of your character. Understanding this idea of spiritual formation, we're spiritual beings on a path. We're being formed. We can't help it, right? We're heading in a trajectory. The question isn't, are we formed? What the, the question isn't, are we headed in a trajectory? It's what trajectory? How are we being formed? It's what psychologist Dr. David Benner calls human being and becoming. We are humans that are constantly becoming. What are we becoming? Whatever we give our attention to is shaping us. And the reality is if we're giving our attention to things that make us busy and constantly in a hurry, they're shaping us in some pretty negative ways. In fact, I could argue they're tearing away our soul. This idea of soulfulness is something my wife and I have been talking about quite a bit in the last few years. Um, we first heard and really dove into it, uh, re drawing from an author, Thomas More, M-O-O-R-E, who is a, a spiritual writer and psychotherapist, but he talks a lot about soulful living, wrote a great book, Care of the Soul, and he really he really argues that soulful living is deep-rooted living. And that in our Western culture in particular, we're losing our soul because it's all about producing things as fast, efficient, and cheap as possible. So we have even buildings. We're building now as fast and as efficient and cheaply as possible. Cookie cutter buildings where now everything looks exactly the same. And we wonder when we go into it, why do we feel detached? Why do we feel like we're losing something, we're losing our soul. Part of this is also we're, we're I think, disconnected from nature, right? Uh, what book was it? It was um, Brian McLaren's newest book, Faith After Doubt, profound, but he talks about how we can raise kids to have a different sort of faith um, that's not just stuck in right beliefs, but expressed in love. And he said, I think one of the, the biggest things we can do for our kids is raise them in nature. See, nature itself honors the rhythms and the cycles that are sacred to all of life. And they're not in a hurry. Nature isn't in a hurry. 
comes and it goes in waves. We go through spring, moving into summer and fall, and it understands that there's cycles of life and it honors those cycles. Also, what this really means to honor the Sabbath, to keep it holy. When we're stuck and almost find ourselves enslaved into these perpetual cycles of producing, is it means that we step back and we reorient our lifestyle. We reorient our focus. We say, I'm a spiritual being that's being formed. How do I want to be formed? Now, I'm going to create a lifestyle in such a way that I have time and I give my attention to that which is most valuable, which is often that we don't have to work for. It's often our spouses, our family, our kids, those relationships close to us. Those are the things that matter most. Our health too. Take care of our health. That's important, right? But what happens is we often get sucked into these other things by our own impulsive, erratic, busy decisions. I, I am just as much to blame as anybody else. I have a confession. Uh, it's not something I'm proud of, but I've bought most cars in my life, uh, and I'm not even 40 yet, than most people have in their entire lifetime. Uh, I'm sure in the past you know, 100 years, a lot more than most people. Now, I haven't bought exotic cars. I've never been able to afford a Porsche or anything like that. But the, the discontent and the impulsive buy of like, well, I wanna try that car, and that car looks cool, and this car looks good, means that I'm spending money constantly instead of being content with what is and saying, no, what matters most is that I don't spend my money and thus have to be more in debt and thus I'm in a cycle of I have to work harder to keep up with the lifestyle that I've created. So Sabbath ultimately means we step back and say, how do we honor these sacred rhythms? How do we not engage in the craziness, the hurry and the productivity of our Western society and say no. Uh, part of this is we're realizing we're taking advantage, we're exploiting the very planet that is meant to help us thrive. Why? Because we're not honoring the sacred rhythms of our own life and the life of the planet, the ecosystem that surrounds us. This is what it means to honor, to observe, to keep the Sabbath, to disconnect and to rest and to honor those sacred rhythms. We've seen this a little bit come uh, in the last year and a half with a global pandemic where we've seen water clear up, we've seen air pollution go away. Why? Because people weren't as busy, right? Because people had to stay home. What we saw is nature begin to flourish a little bit. That should tell us something. That, that, that should reveal our tendencies towards unhealth, towards producing, towards busyness, towards hurry. What you give your attention to shapes who you become. Notice in this command that we read at the very beginning that it wasn't just for the people, but it was for what, what they called aliens or residents, people traveling through, but it was also for their animals, as if to say, hey, all of creation has this rhythm. When you honor it yourself, you allow others and all of creation to honor it. That's how we will flourish together. This is also why I think Jesus talked to his followers in the first century in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, and said this, No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and wealth. I think Jesus was hitting at what he knew was this battle within us, which says, I want to accumulate more. Wealth meaning money, materials, salary, prestige, whatever you feel. The thing where we're trying to fill in this really, what's the core spiritual need with something else that's temporary. And Jesus, I think, was getting at the root and say, that fulfillment only comes from a life following, honoring God and thus honoring the sacred rhythms. What do you value most? I, I wanna invite you, hopefully you'll take this seriously and find some day of rest soon. <laughs> Even if it's just a few hours and say, I'm going to disconnect. I'm going to shut down my computer, my iPhone, all these things that are vying for my attention. I'm going to just put them aside. And I'm going to ask myself these three questions. The first question is, in the last month, what, has, what have I given my attention to? Just being honest. Like, where has my attention been gone? Because it's going to shape the trajectory of my character. It's going to shape who I am becoming. 
What, is, what am I giving my attention to? The second question is, what are the two or three things that matter most? I think oftentimes we live by the demands of everybody else, right? Or by the demands that life presents rather than, you know, what really matters to me because I need to give my attention to those things. What are the two or three things that matter to me the most? The third question is, what fills my soul gives me rest? There, there's no requirement for this. For some people, working out, exercising may give you rest. For others, it might be laying around drinking a glass of wine. For others, it may be reading a book. For others, that might be exhausting and spending time in nature. For others, it might be spending time in a coffee shop. Uh, it, what gives you rest, true, lasting rest? See, what I think happens more than anything is we go, go, go. We run, run. We're in a hurry. We're constantly busy that we're so exhausted. Then we just fall in bed and we zone out with TV. We zone out and we drink a glass of wine and we're just exhausted. Um, I, I admit that's very true of a lot of my life. But rather than doing that, honoring and saying, what gives me rest that allows me to then engage in a soulful way the rest of my life that allows me to engage in the work that I'm called to do? David Benner talks about this idea that we're human beings and human doings that sometimes we, we get in this dichotomy that's what we're one. We're only a human being and we're not supposed to do. But rather the Genesis story says that we are created to take care of the garden, right? We have work to do. But that work is sacred and soulful when it comes out of rest. When it comes out of this soulful place of this is mine to do. When we honor the rhythms of our own life. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, I'm reminded that life itself comes from an inhale and an exhale, that both are equally important. We need times to inhale and rest, and we need times to work. That that work is best when it comes out of a soulful, centered, restful place. Help us resist the grind culture. Help us to honor the Sabbath in ways that are true to our own individual journeys and our own individual lives. What it means to find true rest. Thank you that you are a God that values who we are, not what we do. May we do the things that we do. May we be in the relationships that we are, we are in, in soulful, healthy ways. May we learn to honor the sacred rhythms of life. Amen.